Hi, this is Damon Pistolka, host of the Faces of Business podcast, where we talk to interesting people about life and business. We cover their backgrounds, obstacles they've encountered, and find out what drives them. Along the way, our guests share nuggets you can use to drive your success. Reach me directly, D-A-M-O-N at ExitYourWay.us, or check out our website, ExitYourWay.us, for more information. I hope you enjoy our show. All right, everyone, welcome once again to the Faces of Business. I'm your host, Damon Pastalka, and I am very excited for my guest here today. I've got Todd Russell from Oasis, a Paychex company. We're going to be talking about effective human resources management, and I think this is something that is on a lot of people's mind today, Todd. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Most uh, most people I talk to, this is HR's the biggest point of uh, contention for them right now. Yeah, well, you know, with the great resignation, I think I think this this has been uh, a, quite a shift. I mean, how how long? We'll we'll get into your background a little bit bit before this, but uh, after this, but you know, how long has it really been since there's been an employee market like it is today? Wow. Um, that's, <clears throat> that's a good question. That was the build back after 2008, um, for the tech sector, I think was probably, you know, 2009, 2010, but I don't think it was even like, yeah, anything like it, it was right now. So yeah, <clears throat> I'd say, <laughs> I don't think we've seen anything like this Yeah, where it's just so, um, open for employees right now. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. And we've got Gary. Gary's on here asking, how do I get into the event? Well, Gary, if you go to my profile on LinkedIn, you'll see it live there. And then you can you can watch it right there if you just go to mine on LinkedIn. I want to say hi, Mike O'Connor's here today. Hey, Mike, how you doing out of Chicago? So I know I think I because you just think about it and it, it is it is a universal even when you talk in the manufacturing companies and any place else where there their supply chain problems, they can't get everything. They still can't hire people enough. Like enough. Yeah. People. No. And it's crazy. I mean, the, the companies that can hire, they're paying incredible yes. you know, hourly wages to these guys. Um, I met with a business owner the other day. He's unique. He owns two restaurants. He's, he's not having to pay. Like there's a restaurant right next to his. Um, I would consider them both fast food, but he's paying about two to three dollars less per hour than this competitor in the parking lot is. But the reason he can do that is because of the culture he has at his business. And they're one of the few companies I've seen out there like that. Um, but culture definitely makes a difference. People want to work somewhere where they are appreciated and they feel like they're part of a team, right? So that makes a, a huge difference, but man, yeah. other th other than that, I you know we're looking across the parking lot, fast food place hiring for eighteen nineteen dollars an hour. Um, that's pretty high. Yeah, it is. It is, and and oh, it's the same same thing here. You know, in Seattle, I know that it's it's you know we've got different minimums in the in the city and and things like that. But you know, it is. It's it's. 20 bucks an hour for just about anything anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that doesn't seem to be enough uh, to hire right. people. And it's, there's a lot of different reasons for it. But one of the things that, that you talked about culture and uh, younger people, millennials, Gen Z, I was just, I just heard something today that uh, earlier I was reading this morning, actually, it said that, you know, millennials are the biggest population group ever to hit our, labor pool since the baby boomers yeah and and i didn't i didn't actually realize that till a few years ago when i looked at it and i'm like wow this millennial bubble is really it's quite significant and then when you think about the things that they care about that was what they were talking about they were talking about the fact they care about they want to work for some place that hey they've got a little bit different work-life balance and working for a cause and, and be part of something bigger. And you talk about culture that really fits in there. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, you saw in the tech industry over the last, what, like 10 years ago and stuff, it was really popular to, 
you have the the pool table yeah. or the ping pong yeah. table and and the soda fountains or whatever and companies that had you know uh, people coming in and providing fresh fruit every day mm -hmm. and stocking the fridges and now i think there's still some of that but i think really i mean people are gearing more towards where's the real value like is is there a team here that i want to work with that are supporting me and helping me and are we all working towards a cause that we can get behind and i think that's a big part of business today for sure it is and you that's that's funny you bring it up my daughter very first job out of college she's been out five or six years now first job out of college went to work for a place that did exactly what you're talking about they had outings they had you know friday afternoon food bars they had yeah. i think they even had uh beer tap so after five one day they could have beer in the you know beer or two in the office whatever the heck it was but it was a horrible place to work <laughs> <laughs> well and and you know it, surprisingly a lot of businesses in the past that have had a lot of those things like that it's because their culture really was horrible but they were trying to cover it up with with all these yeah. other things right so the companies that really take a an interest in and focus on building the right culture with a purpose. Those are the companies that really, like the one I was telling you about earlier here, you know, he didn't have to pay two or $3 more an hour for people. People come there through referrals because people love working with him. So yeah, yeah culture is huge. Yeah, that's that's great. That's cool because that's a great example of how and he probably doesn't have nearly the turnover that other people do as well. No, he has 250 employees right now. Um, he is doing phenomenal. His turnovers are really low and he's yeah. got people waiting um, to be interviewed when when there's an open position. Yeah. Yeah. So. And Mike, Mike says something here. He said, that's a good, that's a good point about the cover up. Cause it is, I mean, some of these companies, <laughs> I mean, you look at, and, and I'll, I'll just keep my, my daughter for example. Yeah. So she, she moved to another company. Now this is, this is an engineering firm and old engineering firm. They were way more traditional, but they did have a good culture. It was more, you know, we're here to, to do really good work. We're doing this. And they didn't have some of those frills. They did other things that were nice for their employees and, and developed a more culture based around, you know, we're going to perform well. We're going to work together. We're going to, you know, do what we need to do. She enjoyed that a heck of a lot more and made a lot more money, <laughs> and, yeah. it's, you know, so it's, it really isn't a uh, uh, good culture doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to um you're, you're going to give up anything really as an employee I, yeah i would say it's the opposite right so yeah. if a business owner really does understand the culture and the culture drives business right because once you get the right employees if you're not having to babysit your employees because they love what they're doing yeah that's going to show to your clients right and so that's going to come through it helps them be a lot more productive and, and the bottom line seems to increase, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. So Todd, let's talk a little bit about your background. How did you get into helping people with payroll? Yeah. Sorry. yeah. Not virtual. Yeah. No. no, not virtual, but yeah. your, your work, you know, what, what led you into doing this? Yeah. Great question. Um, my background has always been in technology. Um, I spent time in telecom, uh, started off selling software and computer hardware. And so I've always had that uh, small to medium sized client base. Mm -hmm. And I, I spent probably uh, seven or eight years in, in large corporations and some of the largest out there uh, worked with some large companies and <clears throat> had a good time, had some success through that. But my passion was really working with the small to medium sized businesses. Uh, those are people who are, you know, they're starting a business because they're passionate about a project or a service and they start seeing success. They start hiring people. And then pretty soon before you know it, they're focusing on HR, um, legal issues, payroll, taxes, all these different things, workers comp and, and then benefits for the employees. Yeah. And then 
worrying about the yeah. culture for the employees. They get into where business isn't fun anymore for them and they dread yeah. it almost. And so that's, you know, when I, I saw that a lot in my other businesses that I was working with small to medium sized businesses. And that's just, it made that passion. So every time I went in and I was selling, for example, a hardware or software piece, you know, to help them with their company or telecoms, um, I always wanted to know, tell me what keeps you up at night. Tell me, you know, what is it that, and I'm talking 20 years ago, 15 years ago, what is it that you, if you could change, what would it be? And mm -hmm. finding out what that was and then trying to make that connection for him. Yeah. You know, even if it didn't have anything to do with me. And so <clears throat> fast forward, I, I worked for a company here locally um, and was trying to actually figure out what I wanted to do next um, after I exited that company. And <clears throat> a friend of mine kept pushing me and said, hey, you need to come work at this company. He was owner in the company, went down, finally talked to him. He hit me on the right day and it made sense. And that's been four years ago. And it's been great. It's been phenomenal. Absolutely. I, I mean, I mentioned this to you earlier, but it's this is the best company I've ever worked for from an employee standpoint. Uh -huh. um, paychecks and Oasis have been phenomenal. Yeah. So, but that's <clears throat> that's my background, um, really, on working with a lot of small to medium sized businesses, and that's yeah. been my passion. Cool. Well, you you mentioned you like to help people find solutions, even if it's not you. And I think that shows through. You do a bit, you do quite a bit of networking. You, you facilitate some networking groups there in, in the Salt Lake City area. Talk about that and your passion around, you know, putting people together, helping connect yeah. the dots. So uh, in my twenties, which was a long time ago, I had a Zig Ziglar um, course that I was listening to and, and, one of his sayings, right? If you help enough people get what they want, yep. you'll eventually get what you want. And that kind of stuck with me. I've always had that kind of personality. And so I've always been one to have a group of people that I know if somebody needs an attorney for business, I know who to send them to. If somebody needs, uh, you know, marketing or whatever that might be, I've got an expert that I can put in front of them that I know and I trust. Yeah. And so you know, in the past, I had a group here in town. Um, we had about 22 companies and I put their logos, their name, their phone number, their email address, and a short paragraph about their company or what they did. And 22 of those on the back of a piece of paper. So every time I would meet with a business owner, if they brought up anything on that list, yeah, that was even remotely close, right? Like that was a pain. I'd give that to them and say, here, let me save you some time. Um, any of these people on here, I'm willing to give you a personal introduction to and help you out with, um, they're people that I trust and kind of build that out for them. But that's just always been a passion of mine. So on the networking side of it, um, there's a lot of great networking groups out there. Um, personally for me, I've, I've got one group that's phenomenal that I attend here in Salt Lake city. And then I've got my own that I, that I get together with your part of. Uh, we do, you know, uh, every other week we get together for an hour and talk business, talk about how we can help each other. And then on my personal side of it, um, I make it a goal to reach out to five people in my network on LinkedIn that I haven't talked to face to face that I maybe don't know as well as I should and reach out to them and have a phone call. So I it sometimes takes two weeks to get them on the calendar, but mm -hmm. I go through that and just try to reach out and say, Hey, I just want to talk for 15 minutes. Let's get to know each other. And if there's anything I can do to help you, I want to know what that is. So that's cool. That's yeah. cool. So doing all of this networking, what are some of the things that you, you said, wow, I never really thought that this would answer that. <laughs> well, I, I love that I have, um, I feel like I have a great network nationwide. Um, even though most of my work has been here in, in Utah, um, I spent four years working nationwide and built out my network a little bit that way. But honestly, over the last four years, I've been able to build out a great network of people that when I, when I connect with them, I set up a 15 minute phone call. We have a short call. I get to know who they are, what they do. 
and one thing I can do to help them. You know, what, what does that look like? What is it? it might be, had you ever thought about doing a custom banner on your LinkedIn profile? Yeah. Uh, let, let me help you with that. I'll send you one or whatever. Yeah. And walking through something simple like that. So I don't know. I guess it would be just meeting so many people. I love that aspect of it. I never would have put myself, you know, 25 years ago, I wouldn't have looked at me and said, yeah, I'm going to go meet it. <laughs> yeah. Bunch of people. But yeah. that's, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. No, no, it does. Right. It does. And I think it, I think it's one of the things that you're showing that not only you're doing this locally, you're doing it nationally, but as you start to network, I think, and I, I, I was absolutely just look at the definition of bad network. Her, <laughs> that was me in the dictionary. It was me in the dictionary five, 10 years ago. And once you start doing it, I think you realize there are so darn many interesting and intelligent people to talk to. It's like books. It's like, you yeah. just, you just want to keep reading them because there's so many different people to talk to and, so, and go ahead. Yeah. I, I mean, here's my, my whole theory on that. Right. Um, I don't think I, there's ever been somebody I haven't met that I haven't learned something from. I try to anyway. Uh -huh. um, and we talked about that. I was on a, a call this morning with a group around the nation. There were, you know, 20 something people on the call and we were going through there and there were a couple of people who have just started their own businesses. They're making that leap and getting mm -hmm. out. And one of them had a, a 10 minute presentation and um, just phenomenal. And she's never, had her own business. She's starting out. She's getting things going. And you could tell she was very nervous talking to people. And mm -hmm. we weren't even a big group, but she was nervous talking. And um, she did phenomenal. And there was yeah. such good information that she had there. And so seeing that, seeing people be successful, stepping out of their comfort zone. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that part of it. That's cool. That's cool. Cause it is, it is, you talk about when someone first goes out on their own in business, it's a scary thing because they do, they are in that position. They're the ones yeah. that are going to have to do the presentations to talk to people and all that. And oftentimes that wasn't the case before. Yeah, exactly. I, you know, a quick story. I've got two VPs that I know uh, they're with a company here in Utah. Um, but they weren't active on LinkedIn. They had active, they had accounts and everything, right? Uh, yeah. But they, they weren't very active at all. One of them had never posted on LinkedIn anything. Yeah. And I, he brought me in because he wanted some help with LinkedIn specifically. And so we started talking, we were going through some things and he was having such a hard time just writing a, a, his first post. And I sat there and looked at him. I'm like, let's, let's talk through some things really quick. Let's talk about some of your accomplishments. So he starts listing a few of them. And I knew him and his family a little bit. So I, yeah. I went, listed a couple more. And then I'm like, he says, oh, I wrote a book. And I looked at him and I said, you've written a book? He's like, yeah, I, I, I wrote a book. We've sold like 10,000 copies of it. And <laughs> I have so... Anyway, to fast forward, it's been what a year, year and a half now, and he is he's doing live video on LinkedIn. He's on LinkedIn every day. It's amazing to watch um, people like that that are just so talented and have so much. They're just make that first step and get out yes. in front of people. Yes. So that's an awesome, that's an awesome example because they, we literally have people with incredible stories walking around us every day. I'm, I'm totally convinced at that. And, and that's a, that's a great uh, addition to the yeah. stories because it, it, they just are. Yeah. And there are the people that are sitting in the grocery line by us at our churches, in the schools, along with our kids and, you know, and, and you just don't even know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Every and yeah, I'm I believe that 100%. Everybody's yeah. got a great story. Yep, that's for sure. That's for sure. So, you you read a few books now. I mean, how many like books do you, how many books do you think you're going through in a month? Um, I always have I always have two audibles going. Um, and the reason I do that is because depending on the mood I'm in, right? Yeah. I'll switch back and forth. But I always try to go through about three audible books a month. Um, once I go through an audible, I listen to it. If I love it, I have to buy the book and I have to read it. Um, mm -hmm. And there's just something about that to me that 
it's a lot more meaningful. Um, I think I retain a lot more of it. Um, so probably I would say three books um, a month, and then one that I'm I'm reading a month as well. Okay, so that's cool. So have you always been a reader like that? No, in fact, um, it was probably eleven years ago. Um, I was working with a guy who read two books every week, and wow. he is the uh, he's a phenomenal guy. You look at him and you wouldn't think. Um, and Turbo, I'm talking about you. Uh, that's his nickname. <clears throat> he uh, he's in his sixties. Iron Man like crazy. Um, yeah. He he he's not the quickest out there, but he's done I think thirteen or fourteen Iron Mans. Wow. Um, and when I traveled with him the first time, I looked over and he was reading a book right next to me, and he was just starting. And we got to Boston and he had a different book. And I said, you switched halfway through? And he goes, well, I finished the first one. And <laughs> that kind of got me going like, wait a minute. And so anyway, he and I, he encouraged me to read more. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started reading more and um, just got into it. It's, I, I love it. I love to read. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And not always just business stuff. I got to give a plug here. If you are a sci-fi fan, um, Jump gate Mark, twist. yeah, Mark Van Name, one of the coolest guys I've ever met in my life. Um, anyway, I met him back east at a convention in Boston for um, an IT summit. And the guy, I talked to him for an hour. And then I got this book uh, the next mm -hmm. week when I got home. And I saw his name on it. I thought it was a marketing thing and start going through it. He's written like seven or eight books, probably more than that, but they're just phenomenal. He's a technologist and I love that kind of stuff. So yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Well, and that's cool. And you know, I found too, that I've reached out to a couple authors that I've, I've really enjoyed their books and I, you know, on LinkedIn or something like, or even on Facebook or LinkedIn and, and just really go, I, this, you, you wrote a hell of a book here. And, yeah. and give them reasons why, because I want yep. them to know that I read and I really studied the details. Exactly. It really, it really hit me. And you'd be surprised at how many people will write you back a really nice note. Yeah. And, and I'm like, they're, it's, they're it's real so people. Cool. They're really, yeah. yeah, it's just real people. Cause you, cause you read these books and you go, this is absolutely incredible. And then yeah. you, then, then you connect it to the real person on the other side and they're just normal people. It's cool. And, yeah. and it only goes to show there are these amazing people around us all the, uh, every minute. There really is. There's, I, I've met two authors in the last month. One of them, I've downloaded his book and started listening to it. It's science fiction as well, but he's phenomenal. I, I mean, I got to know him because he does training and uh, we were uh, meeting, we met over LinkedIn and, yeah. um, you know, he's phenomenal at what he does. And then I find out he's not just a speaker and everything else. He's an author and, um, several books that he's written. So I love finding stuff like that out about people. Yeah. It's very cool. Well, yeah. Mike, Mike, he's a, Mike reads a lot of books and he does, uh, um, he does summaries of them. He likes to write summaries about them on his blog. So that's one of the things that he does. He reads a tons of books too. It's really cool. And he also is commenting about your friend that does the Iron Man's at 60. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's quite a feat. I tried to I tried to run a marathon last year, and my knee said no, and they went and had surgery. So, <laughs> so <laughs> that, the guy that I'm talking about there, all CK, those are his, his initials. But we uh, we had a contest at our company. It was an IT company, right, a technology company, and they wanted to have something fun to do. So on the top of the parking garage, they said, "Come bring your bike. And yeah, I'm gonna ride a lap around the." Every time you go around, you have to stop and eat a donut. Oh and god! Then go around. So this guy from our team went down there, and being the Iron Man that he is, right? Yeah. He he won it like crazy. These guys were, you know, on the third and fourth donut, throwing up on the side, and he just kept going around. I think he ate eight donuts. Um, oh wow! Going around, but anyway, yeah, yeah. Fun times, fun things. That is. That is. So, um, let's, let's talk a little bit now. 
I, I do like, I, I know when people listen to this, they go, well, we're going to talk about effective human resource management. We, <laughs> we've been talking about books. We've been talking about networking. We're talking about all this because I really think that that helps, that it helps us get an idea of the person we're talking to. And, and then, and we're going to talk a bit about more about the topic. Um, we talked a little bit about culture earlier and, yeah. and, you know, and the importance of that and then helping that to, to, to retain employees, because it, if you create that good and work environment, people are going to be around more longer, hopefully. Um, right. And now before we got on, we were talking about the, the two things that everybody's talking about is compliance and hiring people. And I want to, I want to talk about compliance a little bit. We'll talk about hiring people, but this is one of the things that I see in a lot of businesses now is that we used to 15, 20 years ago, even five years ago, it was even a lot better. I think you could have someone in the office that's taking care of payroll. They're doing just fine. Um, but the complexity now has gotten more and more. It just seems like it's, it's, could be federal, could be state, could be whatever. These these rules and regulations just keep yeah. piling on these businesses. Uh, whether and, and I don't even know them anymore well enough to even talk about them. But the complexity of it, just to stay in compliance, do you see that as a major challenge for for these smaller companies? Yeah, definitely. For for a lot of my clients, it's it's a big challenge because. Um, everything from HR, right, um, to just operating their business. And then um, even on the tax side, and over the last couple of years, especially through the pandemic, you know, there was so much coming out. Um, the, you know, the free money, the PPP yeah. is, a, is a really free. What do we have to do if we don't qualify for it? What if we do it and then we don't follow up with the things we're supposed to be doing for it? Yeah. And I'm trying to talk to high level on this, but there's a lot out there that affects small to medium sized businesses today. Yeah. And if you don't have an expert in your field, I mean, on your side, helping you out with that, you could be in a bad way. I've, I had one client who has, uh, they're in about 12 states. And <clears throat> in one state alone, they had two issues with employees. And, you know, several hundred thousand dollars later, that... they're trying to figure out, hey, do we need to, and that's actually, why they came to us is we talked and they decided to wait and then they had those two issues and came back to us and those are the types of things that we try to mitigate and come in and help companies with so they don't face those kinds of issues i am always surprised at how many businesses business owners executive i talk to that have a, at least one six figure employee, whatever that happened in the last few years. Yeah. It's almost like everyone has something. Yeah. And it, and it's, it's, it's that kind of work to, to get the compliance or get the, whatever we need to do in, in, um, in order or to prevent that from happening. Cause it's not necessarily compliance. Cause it's been, it's a myriad of things, you know, it's like, right. I, 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 I used a 1099 when I wasn't supposed to use a 1099 or improperly let somebody go. And, and That's because true. they, they were from another state that we won't mention uh, that they, they now have a lot more liability than that they ever realized because their state is much different. Yeah. And, and you know, this, there's so much of this stuff anymore. And now with the remote workforce, it's probably even worse because I can have office people that work in Montana and Texas and Florida and California. It doesn't really matter, but I have to comply with the laws of that state because they're working in that state. Exactly. Exactly. And, and so it's, it becomes a lot, like I mentioned earlier, once, you know, for a small business to get going and be successful and then they're successful so they're hiring more people so they can continue that success and there comes a point where on that graph or that chart right all of a sudden they're spending more time looking at the payroll trying to deal with their taxes trying to deal with compliance trying to deal with all these different areas human resource onboarding culture all these things right and a small business one it, it, they've never got the training. They don't know 
you know, what they should be doing. They don't have the background. So legally they could be in hot water. Right. Mm-hmm. So I don't even know it. Yeah. And so there's a lot of issues there that, that can come up and, and that's really where it is beneficial to have somebody like us, for example, to come in and provide, you know, just HR services only or, uh, the payroll and HR or, or complete benefits, you know, whatever it might be. Um, but that's, <clears throat> I, those are the conversations I have every day. Yeah. Talking to business owners and trying to understand, you know, what is it that's keeping them from being able to build their business? Yeah. And I think the, as I was thinking about this and preparing for our conversation today, I think one thing that has changed in, in human resources, uh, human capital management, whatever you want to say, is that it's getting specialized to the point like tax preparation is or something like that, where you go, I mean, business owners don't not use CPAs anymore. They have yeah. a CPA that's going to fix their, ta- that's going to look at their taxes at least once a year and help them through that. But I think HR has gotten to a point now on that and their people just making sure that they're managing their people using a fractional resource to help effectively manage your your human resources or the people yeah. and the and the thing and make sure you got the processes in place and, and yeah. uh, to be in compliance is yeah, a good way now that's really what we provide right it's it's kind of like a fractional um hr person we provide a dedicated hr person we provide a dedicated payroll person and those are people who are experts and if they don't know the answer they've got people to back them up on their team but with the you know average tenure of uh, like 15 years experience in, in yeah. the HR industry, for example, these are people that have been around the block and, and know what they're doing. So they, if you have they a can problem, they can help. help. Yeah, they can, they can help you. Makes a big difference to a company, right? To be able to have that. So I think you're yeah. you're spot on with that. I yeah, that's the way. Well, it's it it it's it's the changing world we live in, right? It's it's yeah. no different than we talked earlier about. It's an employee market now. It's just the compliance and everything else on on uh, the employee, how you handle employees, and and the importance of uh, doing it right uh, because of the penalties or just because of creating a better culture. I mean, because I mean, look back. I, I always I always think back to. I look, we didn't even talk about onboarding 15 years ago, yeah. right? You hired somebody, <laughs> you just, you know, they, they, they worked with, with Susan over there and Susan was going to be the person that was going to train them. And he made sure everything was okay. They knew where they, you know, had to sign in and sign out, whatever yeah. in their company. And, and they had their, whatever they needed to do their work. And that was it. Yeah. And now we talk about these onboarding process and going through and oh. the training and, and just, just OSHA training and the other kind yeah. of, security training you you have a lot of companies out there today you accept the offer letter and within a couple of days or the next day even you you get a a fedex package in the mail with here's a couple of shirts and hats and here's some stuff for your family and here's some snacks welcome to the team here's a blanket and you know that's just the initial start of the onboarding and it's all about building that culture and getting people off on the right foot if companies really understand Number one, the cost of losing an employee, right? So when you hire and you train, you go through that, there's always a learning curve. And that's money that you're spending, you're investing on that employee. Um, I had a business owner once tell me that the first year is my investment in you. The second, third, and so on are your investments in me, basically, as a company. And he goes, it'll pay off for me in the second, third, and fourth, and fifth year but I'm going to invest whatever I need to in that first year. Understanding yeah. that he wasn't talking about salespeople. He was talking about hiring people for his company. Yeah. I know, electricians and things like that. that for his well, business, it's, but. it's right. So what, what are the kind of the, the numbers that you, you look at now, the cost of losing an employee? It's, I, I don't know if I should even throw numbers out there, but if you look at it, um, you know, as a business owner, you have the cost of their salary, right? But then you have food, a suda, you have all these different yeah. things that come into play. Uh, if you have benefits, you have that on top of there. Um, and then you look at opportunity cost and uh, the cost of that employee 
you know, doing work or not doing work and doing it right or not doing it right. Mm -hmm. And then the training, who is training that person? Some companies have a trainer, so that's a sunk cost really into that person. Yeah. And you're putting a lot of faith in them to go out there and put that. So there's been numbers that have been thrown around of 150% of whatever their salary is. Yeah. I've seen them all the way up to 300% based on their industry and what they're doing. So yeah, it's, it's it, it is. It's huge. It's huge. I was, I was, uh, and well, on this book I'm reading, it's just, is talking about the, not only the cost of losing an employee that they said, they were talking about a player employees. Cause this is, mm. this is where I think it, a lot of people, when you look at cost of employees and, and things like that, yeah. it's like, it, 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 I mean, I don't go to, I, I don't, I don't go to the grocery store and find the cheapest, you know, thing I can find. I find the, yeah. the right thing, right? I'm not looking yeah. for, you know, the cheapest strawberries I can find on the shelf uh, just because they're under a buck or whatever it is. Uh, you got to find the right thing. And I think we, we sometimes as business owners and executives, we, we forget about the, 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 the true cost of the, the, the kind of person we hire. And instead yeah. of looking at the person and hiring the right person for a position, we sometimes get caught up in the wage and, and that wage is just one of the things because you can lose 10 times what you're paying if it's not oh, the right person. Exactly. Uh, especially in these critical positions. But that's, uh, and it's even so much more now because I mean, what are some of the attrition rates you're seeing in some of the people that you, in businesses that you, you know now? So I have had a couple of uh, business owners I've talked to in the last couple of months and that they will hire anybody that applies um, because really? they just need employees. Um, so if you were to look at manufacturing or warehouse, um, those are heavily hit right now. Um, fast food, um, car wash, uh, those are ones that are just trying to hire whoever they can uh, mm -hmm. still so they can stay open. Um, it breaks my heart. We went to... Uh, restaurant the other day we were driving by and pulled up and they aren't able to stay open because they don't have enough employees yeah and this was a standalone building restaurant it wasn't like part of a strip mall this was a you know they probably have normally 30 employees there at a time wow and they couldn't stay open because they only had a handful of employees show up yeah so from the, from that standpoint attrition comes into play big time you, you hire somebody, you put that training in, like we talked about, you've invested in them and you want them to stay there, right? The longer mm -hmm. they stay there, the better, the more effective employee they're going to be, hopefully. And, yep. and so you want to build that out. But yeah, depends it's, on the industry, depends on the company. But I think across the board, attrition rates are worse than they've been in a long time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you, like you said, you've got you've got an example there too. We talked about earlier where the attrition rate is really good because they've got good culture, they've worked mm -hmm. on it a long time, and it was yeah. it was established well before this. So that's that's good to know. And and as you look at at this, do you see that companies are really making some of the changes that they need? They're like, hey, we're just biting the bullet. We're doing what we need to do. Or do you did you see a lot of them? like a turtle crawling, you know, putting the legs inside the shell and waiting it out. No, I think the ones that are like the ladder there, the turtles, I, I think a lot of those have folded and closed their doors. I think the ones that I'm seeing now are more about um, what do we need to do to adapt and change? What, what can we do Good. to improve um, culture and morale? And, you know, is it all about pay or is there something else we can do? And mm -hmm. those are the owners that um, are, I think, really, thriving right now yeah market yeah yeah well that's that's cool because i think that you know while it's it stinks to see businesses go away there's some of them that you know this is inevitable sooner or later because of this or some other reason right um and you know these these when you study these these multi-generational hundred year old companies and these risks just have this huge longevity one of the things that i think is so interesting is they could be building skyscrapers one day and the next day they're in manufacturing and the next, in the next millennia they're in something yeah. else because they're adaptive enough to understand that it's just not working. We got to change or we're going to be out. Yeah. And if you can, if, 
if you're nimble enough to make those changes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and that's that's hard too. But yeah. John John has a good comment here. He said uh, it sets a company back six to nine months. This is one of the oh. things that I that I think is is huge in key roles now because you know just think if you're if you're a development company and you had a SaaS product and you know two of your lead developers walked out. I'd say you got ten and two of them walked out. Holy yeah. heck, that's a yeah. huge huge blow. And then you hire the wrong person for those positions. Mm-hmm. And it's even, you know, you're, as he said, you could be a set back a year or more by that kind of thing. Well, exactly. And I've, I've had companies that I've talked to, for example, um, in the last couple of months that one of them wanted to hire an HR, uh, a VP of HR. Mm -hmm. This is a company that only had, I mean, between 10 and 20 employees. And I was kind of shocked that that was their next hire. They thought they needed a VP of HR. Um, the very high salary Mm -hmm. and, you know, going through the discussion with them as we talked more about it over several weeks, you know, that person was going to come in, but also hire another person, a generalist, because this VP wasn't the one that was going to put the ads out for people. Yeah. Interview the initial interviews, do the onboarding, any of that stuff. So, yeah you know, talking to the business owner and talking through some of that as well, I think goes back to helping them understand the big picture of yeah. what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, cause when you look at that kind of situation, you may want to have a generalist inside cause that might be perfectly sure. fine for your company, but, but use a fractional specialist at that higher level that can set policy, you know, sure. keep track of the things and actually, um, we're, we're helping a company now in, in another area, which is IT and cybersecurity do that uh, just because that is such a specialized field. These fields are getting so it's, it's just incredible yeah. how all this stuff is getting so specialized that unless you're a big enough company, you really can't afford to keep somebody that's at that high, like you said, VP of HR level, just because of the training, the recertification yeah. and all the stuff that they need to do. Yeah, exactly. And what they will and won't do, right? Once, yeah. Once you get to that VP level, you know, or do you still are you still going to be the one that puts the ad in the paper or puts the ad on Monster? I'm dating myself there in the paper. Yeah. That, <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, are you going to pay- process the payroll? Yeah. Exactly. You know that that's not happening. Are you going to work at the you know make sure the timesheets are right for everybody at the end of the yeah. week? It's just not happening, right? So yeah, yeah, it's exactly right. You have to have the right level of people in in your business, and but you need the right expertise for your yeah, business. One hundred percent. And I'm all for HR professionals in in companies. Oh yeah. I, I haven't in four years. I haven't replaced or displaced an HR professional uh, when I brought a client on. So we always, we compliment, you know, what they do. Mm-hmm. Um, the way I look at it in HR, there's about 27 different things that an HR professional should be doing or could be doing according to what falls mm-hmm. under there. Um, but they probably are passionate about three or four and they'll tolerate another two or three of those things, but they probably don't want to do the rest. Yeah. And so that's where we can come in, for example, on the fractional side and and really offset that and help them look like a superstar, which is what we're all about. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so whether it's an HR generalist or the VP of HR, we want to make yeah. sure we help provide that. So, and, yeah. and give that highly trained. It's again, uh, it's not an HR in, in, in some of the smaller companies, like if you had 20 employees, your, your person that's handling HR could be your, it could be Dave, the bookkeeper who yeah. also is a, you know, buys the materials for, for the office and, you know, something else too. And exactly. you're using trained HR professionals that do that day in, day out, all day long. Yeah. And, and the big difference there is uh, we want to come in with somebody who is, they get to know on a first name basis yeah. and that knows their company and that can work with them and help guide them through and help coach them and, and be that true HR support that they need. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, Gary says, you know, it's easily five to six months to train a new employee. And I think that that in a lot of cases is 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 maybe even an underestimate underestimate or let's say understating it a bit 
you know, my words aren't coming out yeah. right, but, but, you know, cause these, some of these are just terribly long uh, to, to show people how to do it, especially if there's complex uh, processes or anything else involved. So right. um, yeah. Awesome. Awesome stuff. Well, you know, I just want to talk to you a little bit about some of your, some of your other passions here. Now you like to ride motorcycle a little bit. I do. And, and if people have not been in Utah, they probably don't understand how beautiful <laughs> of a place Utah really is to ride motorcycle. Yeah. So it is amazing. Yeah. So uh, you, you've got, what's the, what's the kind of motorcycle you've got again? A Honda Africa twin. Okay. So it's okay. an adventure bike. Yeah. Yeah. And about how many miles you put on that thing a year? Um, last year was about 2,500. All right. And that Pretty was good. a short year. So yeah. we had a lot going on, but I'm, I'm hoping to do about 5,000 this year. Oh, good. So we've got some trips planned. So when you're in Utah, have you, have you extensively gone in Utah, North, South, all <laughs> around, or, or is it been good enough that you can just stay around the Salt Lake city area and you're good? So I've done a lot around Salt Lake Park City, um, yeah. up in that area, right? And so the first trip is in about three to four weeks uh, down to southern Utah. Okay. And so that'll be fun. If um, Goblin Valley uh, okay. is a place, state park we're going to go to. All so right. uh, there are some amazing places. Um, southern Utah is just full of different parks, right? Zion's yeah. Grand Canyon, Grand Canyon. Uh, yeah. all these different parks and dirt roads forever. So um, I've got a good friend who's done 40,000 miles in the last like five years on his bike. And wow. he's got a list of must ride this trail. So I'm going through that and uh, getting awesome. out on some rides. Yeah. Because so, yeah. my next question was going to be, where's the best place you've ever ridden in Utah? <laughs> So there's a pass, uh, Guardsman's Pass, um, that goes up from Salt Lake up through the canyon and then comes down into Park City. And that's one of my favorite just because I love this area. Uh, this is mm -hmm. where I grew up and it's the mountains that are here are just is home for me. And um, but going up through there and, you know, you're at night, a lot of switchbacks, a lot of steep um, hills there and coming down the backside into park city. It's just mm -hmm. beautiful. So that's, yeah. And then you've got like two or three different ways you can come home from there. And yeah. So yeah, that's been phenomenal. Love yeah. Good ride. stuff. And then, then you don't, you don't fight the traffic like people would in other places as well. So that's, no, that's really all. good. Yeah. Um, cool. Cool. So you're going to Southern Utah if there would be any dream trip with your motorcycle, what would that be? <laughs> I So let me tell you, if you're a Rush fan, I'm talking about the rock band, right? Oh, Rush. yeah. Yep. Neil Peart wrote a yep. book called Ghost Rider. And his ride from um, eastern Canada all the way across Canada up to um, Alaska and then down to Mexico. Um, <clears throat> I've got friends that have done the um alaska to mexico ride and really that sounds amazing to me i'd love to ride yeah. up to alaska i think that would be phenomenal uh -huh. um yeah just a matter of finding the time to oh yeah be able yeah. to do that but yeah yeah i was just talking to a guy like on, on yeah, i was just talking to a guy on saturday that's getting ready to do the four corners the united states oh. he's going to start out and you know go all the way to hit each corner and come back this summer I forget. I, he said it was going to take him a month or something like that, you know, so he's going to, and it's not going to be that fast, but um, yeah, some of these rides, some of these things that people be able to look at and, and the, 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 there's a lot of beautiful places. I mean, you can go, there's that, the road in Tennessee, it's called dragon something or something yep. like that, that, you know, I've had people that I've talked to that have been on it, but man, I tell you, there are just some, some roads like you're talking that just stick out to you as a motorcycle rider. You go, Oh my God. I mean, yeah. there was, there was one for me. I drove, I drove, uh, I went down and met some people outside of, uh, uh, God, I can't remember, uh, the big park with the, with the El Capitan in it. 
I forget Yosemite. So Yosemite. I'm driving down to Yosemite, right? And I and I I get down there and I'm meeting them in the next morning. So I stayed at a hotel in Sonora and I get in this. I don't even know where the heck it was, but there was a road that went up the hill in over the into the park from from Sonora, I think it was. This road was like 10 or 12 miles long and it was full of switchbacks and tight turns. I mean, like 15, 20 mile an hour, a lot of the way. <laughs> and it was one of those things that you get up to the top and the brakes are just yelling at you and it just it hates you. I went back down and went back up at like three times that day, just because oh, wow. I was ahead. It was so much fun. But these, these things and, and when talking to you, it's so much fun because motorcycle riders, if you've been out and you really love that kind of stuff, it, there's these, these roads that just, just, just like a burn laser burn oh, things yeah. into your head. Yeah. And uh, it's quite a deal, but yeah. I'm gonna, it, I could talk about this for a while. So I will stop because <laughs> we we're, we're talking about effective human resources yep. management and, you know, and Todd, I, I just, I appreciate you stopping by today and explain it because I think this is one of these things that just like anything, I, I think back to the beginning when we were talking, you know, how you'd like to help people. And, and just from, from the, the 22 companies you had on the list on that piece of paper and being able to drop that off with people, I like to share, share people. I know their story, their resources, yeah. because a lot of business owners don't even know they've got this option. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's what I hope we've done today is, is be able to do that. I know that people can reach out to you, Todd and Todd, what's the best place to get a hold of you? What, what do they want to do to get a hold of you? Uh, you know what? I'm always connected with people on LinkedIn. Okay. So Todd um, Russell. So yep. I'll be on this, right? Yeah. So um, that's the best way. And then uh, my email is T R R U S S E L L at Oasis com. Okay. And so I'm, I love to connect. And I would say, you know, one thing that I, I've got like a 47 PowerPoint slide, if I could show that I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the one point I wanted to make on this, I think we've talked about it and in general we did, but better HR delivers better business results. And that is so key to every business. Oh, it doesn't matter it is. what size the business is. It doesn't matter what industry they're in. Yeah, it is. So. It is. It's, it's, it's about, you know, the, the, the better work, the better fit yeah. for the people you can put in the position and then the better workplace that you can create to allow them to be more successful and then, and engage them and get their mind, their heart, their body, and the whole thing, it, the yeah. better off you're going to be. Exactly. Man, yeah. Dave and I appreciate you bringing me on today. Yeah. Thank you very Th much. Thanks so much, Todd. Welcome. Just, just appreciate you being on. Thanks so much. You and bet. thank you. We'll have to come on and talk about motorcycles again sometime because I know it would just, be fun. It, it is. It is a great, <laughs> a great topic in my mind, anyway. But yeah. thanks so much, everybody else, to Mike and John and Gary and uh, Gal. Who else do we have? Cheryl, uh, others that are listening. Thanks so much. We'll be back again next week with with some more guests on the Faces of Business talking about life, business, and hopefully some topics that help people out. Thanks, everyone.